Hi everyone, this is Sue Kotstein here with Leah Krause, Mike Semino, and Pete Chapa. Welcome to the fourth and final webinar in this MSRT series. MSRT is NILA's newest roundtable focused on making and STEAM learning. The three previous introductory webinars in the series, can, can, as Jeremy said, can be accessed on the NILA MSRT website. Please visit, view, and share with your colleagues. This roundtable was started to allow New York State libraries to connect and share knowledge around making and STEAM across all library types and all types of library staff. There's so much innovation and inspired activity happening in libraries right now, and we think it's a critical time to connect, share, and inspire one another as we move in new directions. You can join MSRT for just $5 when added to an existing NYLA membership. Go to NYLA.org and click on Memberships, then Roundtables to join today. We'll start by sharing some save the dates and need to knows about getting involved with MSRT. On October 21st, we will be leading a day-long CE pre-conference at NYLA Annual in Lake Placid, so you want a makerspace. This will be a full day, hands-on workshop that will dive extensively into strategies related to resources, policies, staffing, training, technologies, programs, and more for bringing making to your library. Participants will get a crash course on 3D printing, digital creation, robotics, and more. Registration, um, as Jeremy mentioned, is closed, but please come anyway and uh, uh, sign up at the conference. One of the most important ways you can get involved today with MSRT is to sign and submit the NILA section petition. Our goal is to make MSRT a section so that we can provide multiple meaningful, virtual, and on-site connecting and learning opportunities, not only at the annual conference, but throughout the year. Making MSRT a section will allow us to have a seat on NILA Council so we can move the making and STEAM agenda forward through libraries across our state. To help make MSRT a section, please go to the NILA MSRT website and submit the form you'll find there by mail, fax, or email. Look for your chance to sign a petition at the MSRT showcase on the trade show floor at the annual conference in Lake Placid. And now over to Leah. Thanks, Sue. So a little bit about what we're going to cover today. We're going to jump into some strategies for taking the first steps with developing maker initiatives at your library. We're going to talk about strategies related to staffing and training, community involvement, funding and resources, assessment tools and strategies, and then finally at the end we'll take questions. So just briefly for those of you have not, who haven't attended our previous sessions, I'm just going to start with a quick um, overview of who we are at the Fayetteville Free Library. So the Fayetteville Free Library is a public library located in central New York. We were an early adopter of making in libraries. As far as we're aware, we're the first library to provide open access to the tools of making, including 3D printing, starting in 2011. And today we have three distinct makerspaces in operation, our FFL Fab Lab, our Digital Creation Lab, and our Little Makerspace. The FFL Fab Lab is our fabulous laboratory, where we have digital and analog tools and technologies related to fabricating physical objects. So the space includes 3D printers, a laser cutter, vinyl cutter, sewing machines, craft tools, hand tools, electronics equipment, STEM learning kits, and more. And over the past four years, we've certified over 3,000 people on equipment in our fab lab. The FFL Creation Lab is our digital maker space. It features technologies needed to make digital media, including a green screen, Mac and PC computers with creation software, podcasting equipment, photo and video equipment, and more. Finally, we have our Little Maker Space. It's geared to kids ages 5 to 8, and the space features kits, toys, and supplies to encourage children to get started with the maker mindset, discovering, designing, creating, and building. So how did we get to where we are today? What are some of the key strategies we employed in order to successfully develop three maker spaces and related maker programs? We had to start somewhere, right? We had to take the first steps. Our key strategies for getting started have been as follows. With developing any new service or program, um, the important thing is to start with your particular community's needs and priorities in mind. What community goals will your maker program seek to meet? What gaps will it seek to fill? 
And once these intended outcomes are established, the key is to start somewhere. Sure, you may have an enormous vision of all the things you eventually want in your space and all the wonderful programs you will do there, but you shouldn't feel like you have to wait to get started with making until you have acquired everything that you want, for instance. We have found success with starting small, collecting evidence of success and needs being met, and then moving forward, building upon successes incrementally. We have found that this strategy has been helpful for both building the program in a manageable fashion as far as resources are concerned, and building staff and community buy-in. Finally, a key for us has been to involve staff members across all areas of responsibility in our planning and initial phases, which we'll talk about more in a minute. So I want to share a few examples of instances where we identified community needs and priorities, took initial sort of smaller steps towards implementing a maker initiative to meet the need, and then collected evidence of needs being met, resulting in us expanding upon the program or service area. And I'm going to run through these examples kind of quickly to share our overall strategies related to planning and growing our initiatives. So if as I go, a question comes to mind related to a specific service or program, please post it in the chat so that we can address it at the end. So we have four programs you can see on the slide here. Our sewing program and service area, our Lego robotics offerings, our Geek Girl Camp program, and our Fab Lab service area as a whole. In terms of identifying needs, the sewing and Lego robotics programs were instances where members of our community explicitly told us that they wanted them. With Lego Robotics, we had parents and grandparents approach us and say, there is nowhere locally for my child or grandchild to be involved in a first Lego League team, which is a national competitive Lego Robotics League. With sewing, we had people asking us if the library would ever consider hosting sewing classes. They were saying that kids were starting to learn sewing in school, but wanted somewhere to go to continue learning. Or we had adults indicating they had specific projects that they wanted to make, or that they wanted to refresh skills that they had learned earlier in life, and were sort of looking, hey, where can I go to do this? With Geek Girl Camp and the Fab Lab, these were areas where we identified gaps in access in our community, and we felt the library was uniquely situated to fill those gaps based on our mission and our existing role in the community. We knew that there was a strong interest in emerging technologies in our area. We, knew, we also knew that families in our area placed a heavy importance on academic excellence. We also knew that there was nowhere locally that people could go to access digital fabrication technologies or learn how to utilize them to the fullest. Nor was there anywhere that girls could go for a low cost, immersive STEM camp experience where they were not only developing STEM skills and interests through fun hands-on activities, but were also building interest and confidence in the idea of STEM careers through meeting and interacting with women in STEM fields. So in all four of these areas, having identified needs, we tested the waters, saw that the waters were great, and we were able to confidently dive in farther. With sewing, what this testing and moving forward sort of looked like was doing something as simple as putting signs on the back of the bathroom stalls in our library, asking people if they were interested in sewing, and if so, to let a staff member know. We had a huge number of people come forward looking to both learn and teach sewing. So as a response, we bought four $70 sewing machines and put them on a media cart we already had and rolled them out for volunteer-led programs several times a month. We had such high attendance and interest that we ended up developing a dedicated drop-in sewing area in our Fab Lab space when we developed that later. With LEGO Robotics, we tested the waters by holding a first LEGO League interest meeting. Our community room was full of families interested in joining the team. This further confirmed that the need and interest were there. So we started a team, and as of today, we've hosted four seasons of First Lego League. We've actually seen such continual interest in the area of Lego robotics that where we have had more kids at any given time than we can accommodate in the team. So this has led us to develop additional opportunities, including hosting our own standalone Lego robotics challenge programs once a month. We call them Lego Brainstorms for grades three to five and Lego Mindstorms for grades six through nine. This year, we've also grown to add a first tech challenge team for grades 7 through 12. With Geek Girl, to test the waters, we said, let's start with a pilot year. We'll offer a STEM camp for girls in grades 3 to 5 during our summer reading program. We had 44 girls sign up for the pilot year and an equal number on the waiting list. So again, we could clearly see we were moving in the right direction. 
We have since expanded on our STEM offer offerings and camp opportunities for girls and boys of all ages, offering a second round of Geek Girl Camp this past summer, and now currently working on a STEAM Camp for Boys opportunity for summer 2016. Finally, with the Fab Lab, we started by acquiring a donation of a 3D printer and hosting Maker Open Houses once a month in our community room, where we'd roll out the 3D printer, our laptops with free 3D modeling software, donated electronics items to take apart, and other making opportunities. Again, we had huge attendance numbers that confirmed to staff and stakeholders that this was a direction our community supported. We saw the clear evidence that needs, the need and interest were there. And we had both the numbers and comments that proved that if we built a makerspace and opportunities, they would come. When we first started developing our actual space, we did not fill it up right away with the things that we thought people would want. We made it a point to provide many opportunities for community members to contribute ideas, including having giant post-it notes on the walls and prompts throughout the space for patrons to answer questions like, what would you like to make? What would you like to learn? And what should go here? This has really informed the development of our maker offerings, such as the addition of a laser cutter and CNC mill in our Fab Lab space. So this is all to emphasize that a strategy we have found successful is to develop your maker opportunities in order to meet identified needs for your community. See where your successes are, collect and analyze feedback, and grow and adapt accordingly. And we'll talk more specifically about some of the tools and strategies that we use to collect and analyze community feedback at the end of our presentation. If your first steps with making are done with the approach just described, we found this can solve many issues related to staff and community buy-in. If you're planning your maker initiatives to meet community needs, there will naturally be many people in your audience who inherently understand the value of what you're doing. And for those who do not at first understand the value, you will have identified and therefore be able to clearly communicate the needs your service will meet. Shortly thereafter, once you've gotten started, you'll have tangible evidence of success to point to as you grow your service. Another key strategy related to staff buy-in for us has been to involve staff from all departments and areas of responsibility early and often with the development of our maker initiatives. And we think that doing this really just makes sense since making has implications for everything from collections to technology, from training to patron services, and it includes all audiences from kids to adults. So by providing opportunities for staff members to share ideas and contribute, nobody feels like making is something that's happening in a vacuum, something that they don't understand and has nothing to do with them. At our library, we accomplish this by having maker forums that meet once a month where we discuss everything making at the library. Professional staff from across areas of responsibility attend these meetings, and everyone has equal opportunity to share ideas and weigh in on creative development related to our maker spaces, programs, collections, and services. With this being the case, everyone is informed and involved with our new initiatives. So making isn't seen as one staff member's responsibility. Development is a shared team effort, and everyone holds a shared stake in making. So now I'll turn it over to Pete to discuss strategies related to staff and patient training. Hi, everybody. So our overall goal when it comes to staff training is not to require everyone on staff to have an expert level of knowledge on all the equipment and programs in our labs. Uh, that would be kind of unrealistic and really unreasonable of us to expect. So, But we do, however, require all staff to have a basic understanding of how the machine or program in the lab works and also to have a basic idea of some troubleshooting tips that they could run through should there be a problem. Um, if a staff member doesn't know how to answer a question that a patron has that may be more in depth on something, um, they can either look it up themselves, much like tr traditional librarianship, uh, if you come to the reference desk and you don't know the answer, you look it up. Um, or you could ask another member on staff that you think would have the answer. Um, but we also offer these monthly brunch and learn opportunities um, that serve as opportunities for staff to fill the gaps in their knowledge. Um, basically, these programs are staff-led training opportunities on a particular service, machine, or program. And although we do bring it, sometimes bring in an expert if needed, um, all professional staff are invited to come and learn about something new being offered, and sometimes these brunch and learns just serve as refreshers if a, if a staff member hasn't 
used a piece of equipment in a while and they just need to kind of relearn. These, what is offered for monthly brunch and learns are often identified by staff members during our forum meetings. Um, if a staff member feels uncomfortable with their level of uh, working knowledge on a service being offered here, they can bring it to one of our four forums that we offer um, and have a brunch and learn set up uh, in the future for more training. This seems to work really well because, again, if they need a refresher, they can just bring it and openly share it with everybody and they don't have to feel embarrassed about it. Um, we also have training checklists that for each of the machines that <clears throat> that we have in our uh, maker spaces. Um, we set up these uh, checklists in order to make sure that every staff member is trained to the same basic level um, of working knowledge on the machine. Uh, the staff can also use these training checklists as a reference for any patron trainings that they might do uh, later on. Staff members also end up uh, teaching themselves because every member of the professional staff is required to staff the Fab Lab desk at least once a week and offer at least four one-on-one -on -one patron appointments a month. This provides incentive for the staff members to keep up with the services offered because they al they're also responsible for passing the information on to patrons through these one-on-ones. This is an example of our training checklist that we go through. This, ha this one happens to be for 3D printing. Okay, so making sure staff members know how to use all of the machines in our makerspace is only half of the goal. We also need to make sure that our patrons know how to use the equipment safely, um, efficiently, and autonomously. We want to make sure that not only will a patron be able to learn and create safely, but we also try to make the experience as frustration-free as possible. It is for this reason that we require all patrons wishing to use any equipment that plugs in to take a certification class with a staff member or volunteer uh, before they use the machine on their own. In each certification class, patrons learn how to operate a machine safely, as well as some tips on how to succeed with the machine. A good example is, of this is we will show a patron what to look for when selecting a model to 3D print. If the model isn't set up correctly, a patron could end up with a big ball of stringy plastic, which is not satisfying. In order to keep up with patron demand, each professional staff member offers four one-on-ones per month. These one-on-ones can be about a wide range of topics from job search and resume help to basic computer skills and Fab Lab certifications. During the summer, when demand for the Fab Lab certifications is much higher, one of each staff member's one-on-ones is converted into a class for up to eight people for some piece of Fab Lab equipment, 3D printer, laser cutter, sewing, or more. During our one-on-ones, patrons sometimes ask questions that we don't know the answer. Um, most of the time, they're more technical than someone with a basic knowledge of the machine knows. When this happens, we use it as an opportunity to learn together with the patron. After all, we're librarians and we can find anything, right? After the training is complete, we make sure that the sure to provide the patron with easy access to material they just learned. In some cases, it can be a lot of information to take in all at once, and we don't want patrons to be afraid of using any of the equipment because they don't remember a step or are embarrassed to ask for help. We provide these materials in the form of bookmarks, videos, and links to online resources. Of course, there's always someone at the desk in the Fab Lab to ask if they need help. Continually assessing our training formats has played a key role in our success. As I mentioned earlier, in the summer we offer training classes for equipment in the Fab Lab. This came about because we were assessing our one-on-ones and we noticed that patrons were having to wait up to six weeks to get the information they needed. This is way too long. When we looked at what was causing the backup, we noticed that almost all the appointments were for 3D printer uh, training certifications. We figured that a training could be applied just as effectively in small groups as it could be one-on-one, -on -one, so we asked each librarian to change one of their one-on-ones in July and August to a 3D printer class 
and if anyone called looking for 3D printer training to sign them up to those classes instead of the remaining one-on-ones. This cleared up the jam and reduced patron wait time significantly. Continuous assessment not only tells you if you're meeting or in some cases exceeding your patron's needs, but it also allows you to correct any problem areas before it gets to be too late. And lastly, I'm not, I'm not sure if I can stress this enough, uh, but we would not be able to provide the same level of service to our community if we did not have community volunteers backing us up. Our volunteers do a r wide range of things from staffing the Fab Lab to providing one-on-one -on -one assistance with specialized computer programs. And for a more in-depth look into how to engage with community participants, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Pete. Let's take a look into community involvement. And uh, a key component of getting our makers uh, programs off the ground has been community involvement. We truly believe that every community is filled with talented and passionate individuals, people who are often itching to get involved and share what they know with their neighbors. We believe that the library's role is to serve as a platform, a place for these individuals to come together and connect with other curious people. It has been our experience that maker initiatives are successful when they allow people to engage with the library and the community, community in meaningful ways, enriching ways. Oh, and don't think that the individual community members are the only source. Look to organizations and businesses as you're planning your maker initiatives. There's no way that we can all be experts on every new tool or concept or software out there around making, nor should we. But most likely there is a person, a business, or an organization that does have expertise in one area or another. So what you're looking at here um, is what's our uh, community engagement form. And you can, you can gather those great and talented community members in, in using this form. Going as far back as the Maker Open Houses when we were hearing how eager people were to uh, get involved, we began to make a targeted effort to capture those sort of informal conversations that we were having and allow people to get involved and engaged in a deeply meaningful way. We developed this community engagement tool that we now feature in our public spaces and use it to capture just the kinds of informal conversations that we were having before. It's adapted from the works of John McKnight and Peter Block from their book, The Abundant Community, and this form serves as our new volunteer application. When we're talking with someone who says, I'm interested in what's going on here and I would love to get involved, or I'm a robotics enthusiast, for example. We use the tool to capture their enthusiasm and parlay that into involvement. Instead of our old volunteer model, where we slotted people into roles that we had identified a need for, we now invite the community to come to, uh, to us with their ideas and their interests. We open up the library as a platform on which they can share their ideas and make meaningful connections in areas that they're passionate about. The direct result of community particip participants leading programs at our libraries has been huge value adding to the community. Community members are able to lead classes, clubs, and programs on a huge range of topics that result in significant savings of resources, both time and programming costs. So what can partnerships look like for you? Remember, just like your maker programs, your partnerships will be unique to your community's talents and strengths. One of our earliest Express Computer Services. Back in 2010, when we began to understand that making was the direction our community wanted us to go, Express donated our first 3D printer, one that had to be assembled. So how do you put one together when very few people even know what a 3D printer is? Well, look to your community. College students and some patrons helped us to put this machine together. With 3D printing now available, naturally 3D Computer Aided Design, or CAD, uh, was the next next logical step. And in our community, there was a significant community of CAD users already present. Uh, through informal and formal conversations using that community engagement tool, we found that multiple local manufacturing businesses purchased software through their local retailer. This software was donated to us, and now we have community members training other patrons on this software. So don't think that you have to become proficient in new software. Again, look to your community. Think about ways in which patrons can access information and ways to learn new skills. Sure, the library can host classes on X topic, but many times community members want to find ways to learn for themselves. And in our case, WebUcator, a local tech learning company, 
has partnered with us to provide patrons with self-guided courses. Look to your local colleges and universities. Many programs of study requ require volunteer hours or internships. This is a great way to find help, support, and enthusiasm to move your programs forward. And finally, we have found that once we embrace making as part of our mission and our community, local businesses and organizations began to come forward to us looking to partner in ways that we have proven to be mutually beneficial. One example was with our MakerBots, a startup company was looking to make old factory equipment smart. And while 3D printers are certainly considered new technology, they're not as smart as you would think. The company partnered with us so that they could prototype new ways to gather data from these dumb machines. Well, whatever, uh, what better way than with a small 3D printer? Through this partnership, we've learned more about our printer capabilities and preventative maintenance needs. And then this new info has changed how we certify patrons through our one-on-one -on -one trainings. So to kind of recap, really, uh, really focus on the talents, skills, and passions in your community uh, with your community members, and nurture associational life, and focus on accessibility to all. Hi everybody, it's Sue again. I'm going to now jump into some additional strategies related to finding the funds and resources you need to move forward with developing maker programs. Mike just discussed the important role partnerships can play in acquiring things you need for your maker initiatives. Partner shamelessly and relentlessly. An additional strategy is to apply for grant opportunities and awards. More than ever, funding opportunities are available through local and national sources to support informal STEM learning and making. IMLS, for instance, has identified making in STEM as a top funding priority as they imagine the future library. Once you have your maker program underway, there are also opportunities to apply for awards if you're doing something and you've collected evidence that you're doing it well and meeting needs. Every time your library team writes a journal article or a national blog post or applies successfully for a grant or receives a hard-earned award, you're raising your library's profile and increasing your chances of being an attractive partner for more robust grants and awards that can help propel your making initiatives to the next level. Put yourselves and your success out there. Be visible. Write about it, shout it out, and lead the way. This level of success is evidence that libraries are critical players in the DIY, maker, and informal STEM learning ecosystem. We are already here, everywhere, in every community across the country. There's a library platform ready and able to facilitate and support its community's needs. However, we would stress that you don't have to wait for that grant to come through or that award to appear to make making happen locally. We got created with and leveraged what we had and found many ways to get started with making before we ever had received a dime of grant funding. Another crucially important strategy is to continuously ask ourselves what can we stop doing to be able to reallocate our budget, physical space, and staff time. We'd like to point out that the majority of items that we have in our maker spaces were purchased from dollars that already existed. We reallocated and shifted in order to meet current community needs and priorities. The majority of our maker spaces and maker activities are taking place in the physical spaces we already had available to us. And we did not hire additional staff to be able to staff our maker spaces and uh, provide training opportunities. Diving a little bit more into the resource reallocation piece, here are two strategies we've embraced for finding funds, staff time, and space for making within what we already had. Our strategy was to rethink our programming budget, or one strategy, by opening up the library as a platform for community members to share what they know with their neighbors. We've been able to move away from paying experts to give lectures and presentations the result of which has allowed us to reallocate a substantial percentage of our programming budget toward making and STEAM initiatives. We have similarly moved away from paying performers to deliver children's programs and instead we invest in STEM kits, technologies and tools that can be used over and over in scheduled programs as well as on a drop-in basis. 
A second strategy was to perform an in-depth reference assessment in order to make better informed decisions about service desk staffing and reference materials purchasing. We collected several pieces of information and utilized several tools, including a tool called Gimlet, to determine what times of day we were getting the most questions, what types of questions we were being asked, what resources were, we were using to answer questions, and more. The results of this assessment has been that we could confidently determine what to stop doing, what was no longer valuable or a good use of time and resources, to be able to start doing more in identified areas of value and relevance, such as making. We'd like to share some of the tools we've used to develop our initial maker initiatives, assess them, and then build upon our successes. Constant formal and informal organization-wide assessment allows us to sustain and grow in directions that prove and bring value to our community. On the screen is our FFL proposal template. This tool allows us to ensure that all of our program, space, or service initiatives, including those related to making, are developed with community needs and outcomes at the forefront. With our proposal template, everything at the library begins by identifying intended impacts. No longer are we saying, let's try this because it sounds cool and interesting. Instead, now we're able to say confidently, let's try this in order to achieve X results and in order to pr prove that we've achieved X as a result, we're going to collect X pieces of information along the way. On this screen is our FFL assessment tool. When we started with making, we very quickly began to see new types of impacts that we did not necessarily anticipate. We saw people using the library in new and groundbreaking ways. We saw that our programs, services, and spaces were now strengthening local small businesses, facilitating the development of inventions and innovations, causing local young people to get excited about STEM topics and deepen their STEM skills, and more. We began thinking more critically about how to best capture these meaningful impacts. In doing so, we developed this assessment tool that we now use with initiatives across the library, including our maker programs and spaces. You'll notice the synergies between the assessment tool and proposal template. They are, in fact, by design, two pieces of the same puzzle, where the proposal template encourages outcomes and impacts-based planning. The assessment tool ensures that once we've taken action, we're collecting the data that tells us what we really need to know. We're analyzing it in a way that clearly illustrates impact. We're identifying opportunities for growth and change. And we're communicating results in a meaningful way to constituents and stakeholders. Both the proposal template and the assessment tool have a strong focus on data, both qualitative and quantitative, and evidence, gathering it, analyzing it, and communicating it. Next are just a couple examples of ways that we collect patron feedback. The one-on-one -on -one appointment survey you see on the screen is one of the few targeted instances in which we use satisfaction surveys in the library. We have a great opportunity directly following a live training session where we have a captive audience and can ask them to fill this out to help us better adapt the trainings to meet their needs. Questions one through three, do you feel ready to use the equipment on your own and do you feel confident in your ability to use the equipment safely, helps us ensure that we're providing adequate training and allows the respondent to tell their story. Did you get what you need? Moreover, this survey also helps indicate to us through question number four, how are you planning to, on using this knowledge? Exactly what stands to be gained in the life of this individual because of access to this technology and this training? What did you learn and what will you do with it? Questions five through six help us understand where the opportunities lie related to communications and promotion about our Fab Lab services. What marketing practices are effective in engaging people and getting people through the door? What's working? <clears throat> Next, our FFL Capturing Stories is a tool in process that we have developed to help us do just that. Capture the meaningful qualitative evidence, the stories that put an important context behind everything going on in our library and in our maker spaces, and its impact on the lives of our community. We can confidently say that based on our event stats, we know we've trained over 3,000 people on Fab Lab equipment, but it all takes on more meaning when we see the stories of how people are using the equipment and space once they have gained their new skills. 
So when we have an informal conversation with someone who says something like, let me show you what I've been working on over the past couple of weeks. It's a prototype for a new invention. I've got it perfected. And now I'm using the Digital Creation Lab to put together a video for Kickstarter or some other very meaningful impact. We use this form to capture the story, whether it's a written story blurb, a podcast, or a video for sharing out for promotion, building awareness, and advocacy. We'd like to wrap up by mentioning some steps in this process that you can't miss. This is not the fun, creative, sexy stuff. This is the functional compliance and safety stuff. As you determine what you want your maker initiatives to look like, it's critical to be talking to your local experts and authorities along the way. If you plan to introduce a new tool or technology into the space, you'll need to work with your local codes enforcer to make sure you're in compliance. You'll need to discuss your plans with your liability insurance provider to make sure you're covered for the types of activities that will be happening in the space. These are critical steps to ensure that your makerspace A will be open and B, and B will stay open. Finally, it is important to have a plan for success. If your initial forays into making go well and you do see a huge evidence of need and desire for growth in that area, what are some strategies and approaches you can take to grow your overall budget to meet these identified needs? Where will we build new capacity into our budget? How will we seek to develop relationships to accomplish this? Your budget ideally will exceed your aspirations. How do you get there? As we move on to Q&A, we want to leave the screen up for a minute. These are some free web resources that we use for project ideas, digital creation, 3D modeling and printing, and general inspiration and advice about developing and growing maker initiatives at our library. One we in particular would like to point out is our website. It's one of the most comprehensive library making makerspace resources out there. Don't worry about writing any of this down. These slides will be accessible through the archive on the NYLA MSRT webpage and at www.fflib.org backslash make. So please refer to the contact screen on slide, slide one for our contact information. Contact any of us at any time, and we look forward to seeing all of you at the pre-conference at NYLA in Lake Placid. Jeremy, we're eager to answer questions. Excellent. Um, we do have some uh, some questions that have uh, accumulated, um, and I'll remind everyone that you can use the sidebar on the right-hand side of your screen to type in additional questions as these are being addressed. Um, the first one um, came from Michelle, and she asked if you could please uh, tell us more about the Geek Girl Camp um, program. Sure, absolutely. Um, so we started the first year we did Geek Girl. It was the summer of 2015. 2014 and um, it was a program that we put together for girls in grades three to five. Um, we, like I said, we identified a local need in that area where there were no STEM camps for girls, um, particularly in that age group. We, there were STEM camps that we saw available for middle school age girls, but we also did a lot of research um, into this kind of area and noted that kind of the three to five age group was some, a place where um, where girls were still really interested. It was kind of a pivotal, pivotal time in their formative relationship with how they felt about STEM topics and also kind of forming opinions about careers that might be suitable for them. So we really set out with the goal of meeting that camp need and particularly the need for hooking these girls up with STEM role models, women in these fields that they could meet, um, I, you know, kind of identify with, develop relationships with, as well as building a community um, of girls who would attend the camp and then have additional opportunities to come back together throughout the year, um, meet back up with the girls that they had made friends with, kind of geek out some more, and uh, continue into future years. So, like I said, we started the camp and we had we had huge response. We had um, we kind of had said this first year, let's try 40 girls, and we had a more much a bigger list than what we could accommodate. So since then, um, what what the camp actually looked like was 
a week-long program where we had girls in every day from between 9.30 and 3.30. So it was really a full week, full day, uh, immersive experience. Um, we would break down the activities, things like you could see the pictures there, everything from launching rockets and Skyping with a woman um, who trains astronauts at NASA to building um, model cars to, to doing coding and just a huge range of activities. Um, and we, we, again, identified some impacts that we wanted to collect where we asked the girls on day one things like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And we heard some... Uh, a range of answers, an actress, a ballerina, president, all sorts of good things, but by the end of the camp we asked them the same question and we were hearing things like, I want to work for Google, I want to be an astronaut. Um, so we did really see attitudes changing. Um, since then, we've obviously seen the demand, we've also seen parent demand for a kind of a geek boy camp opportunity and uh, a similarly immersive experience and that's something that we're working um, we're working towards for 2016. We've also added day-long opportunities over school breaks um, for geek girls and we'll be doing a geek boy kind of day in February 2016 before we roll out with the week-long camp and again that's kind of gauging um, it allows us to inform our planning for the for the week-long camp. Um, so I hope that answers your your questions. If you have more questions, you can definitely email me. We have a lot a lot of information to share about that camp. Thank you, Leah. And just to confirm, the the Geek Girl Camp is a week long. Yes. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Uh, the next question we have is uh, from Tina, and it asks, uh, did your community businesses only donate the equipment, or did they also volunteer to use or even help build it? In, uh, in the cases that we've come to, it's actually been the donation of the materials. Um, computer, like I, I think referring to Computer Express services, they, um, they did not assist in the construction of the 3D printer. Those we found through uh, other college students and patrons. Um, so not, not all the time. Sometimes they'll uh, just donate the equipment. And again, look to your community. Excellent. Thank you. Um... Uh, Michelle asks, I frequently struggle with how to assess the quality of instruction with only one student. Um, do you feel you get honest answers if the patron knows that it will be seen by the instructor? That's an interesting question. I, I, I think, uh, once again, we're very reluctant to use satisfaction type surveys because often, just as I think Michelle's poking at you, you kind of it's difficult to craft those without um, uh, soliciting the answer that you anticipate. So, and, and I do understand that, that there's pitfalls with it. With our particular approach to uh, the satisfaction survey that we shared with you, we're, uh, our questions are a little bit more open-ended and we're trying to discover um, if the experience was meaningful to the person through, through their lens and what they might do with the skill that they've learned. So we're not really asking, you know, what did you think about the instruction and, you know, was the instructor competent or the kinds of questions that you might typically see on a satisfaction survey. Our satisfaction survey is more tailored to solicit this type of information. Did you get what you need? Do you need something more? If you gained a skill, what do you plan to do with that skill? So we're really looking towards collecting information that we can look to as a definite outcome of this investment of staff time and resources into the whatever training is being offered. Excellent. Sounds good. Um, the next question comes from Melanie. Uh, she asks, urban branch libraries often face issues with staff shortages. Did implementing these new programs and having a makerspace require additional staffing, or was uh, the oversight of these, these programs and things integrated into the responsibilities of the existing staff? A little bit of that and more. Um, when we initially started going down the path of making, we understood that in order for us to be successful with bringing the entire staff on board with this new direction that we were moving in with library service, everyone needed to be involved across the organization. We didn't want to create a culture where uh, making is only the responsibility of a certain few on the staff. 
So as Pete was talking about with our staff trainings, our original approach, which we maintain today with our staff, is that all staff works with the same level of general knowledge, really across our organization, but in particular in this context with our makerspaces, to ensure that not only are they fully equipped to provide excellent service to a patron at any time, but also that they're equipped in terms of their own confidence and that they have um, all of the, the training and information that they need in their own individual toolbox, regardless of what their primary area of responsibility might be in the library, we all have the same level of general information to be able to provide the same level of service to our patrons. It's one of the reasons why um, on, uh, incorporated into the professional staff's existing responsibilities, we do require each member of the team to work a shift once a week in the fab lab to keep them connected, to keep their skills sharp, to keep them in front of the, the community of users, and also to uh, you know have that face time with the community of users as well. It keeps the staff engaged on, on, on a personal level uh, beyond uh, this is uh, simply another task that's been assigned to me. Does that answer your question? Uh I, th I think so. <laughs> uh, Melanie okay. can certainly uh, type in a follow-up if she, she has one, but I think now, you covered if it. If you have particular, you know, particular questions about that piece and you'd like it more information, once again, you can me email any of us. You can email me, and we'd be happy to uh, uh, give you some more uh, insight into our journey with, with that. Excellent. Uh, Danielle has a very uh, nuts and bolts question. Um, do you charge uh, for material use such as a 3D printer filament? Uh, and if so, what minimal fee uh, would you recommend? Uh, yes, we do. Um, we For the 3D printer filament, we've figured out that it comes in kilogram rolls, and we basically just charge for the replacement cost of the plastic used. So it's about $50 a roll. We figured it to be five cents a gram, which is what we charge the plastic, uh, the patron. After they've printed something out, they bring the the whole print, including any support structure that was printed out, over to our little digital scale we have. They pop it on the scale and um, weigh it up, and 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 it, yeah, it figures to five cents a gram. Um, for other pieces, other things in the lab. Um, the use of the machine, there's there's no charge for it's basically consumables uh, like the vinyl cutter. They can purchase vinyl from us or bring it from home. Uh, the laser engraver, if they have a piece of wood or something at home they want to engrave, they can just bring it in. Or we do have some supplies here for them to purchase, and it's all just cost recovery. Uh, there's no profit for us. So. And can I just add one thing to that? Um, we. What is also really important to note is that, especially related to 3D printing, um, but really any of those things, the cost if a patron was to go elsewhere to do something similar, to go, for instance, to a for-profit makerspace or to send out a 3D design to like Shapeways or a service where they could have it um, printed and sent to them, the, the costs are just you know tenfold or more compared to um, what they would experience for printing at the library. So we're really removing a huge barrier in that respect. They don't have to you know pay a membership fee like they would for access to a, a, a for-profit makerspace. Um, so again, yeah, um, while there is the cost to offset the charge of the plastic, it's um, it's very kind of negligible and um, it's much more affordable than it could be accessed at anywhere else. And it's also based on our paper printing model. You know, so our patrons, and I'm sure yours are as well, they're, they're very, um, uh, it's a natural thing um, if, they're, if they're going to print paper copies that, that if there's a small fee involved with that. So uh, we based our small fee related to the plastic based on our uh, paper printing. So, you know, it wasn't a, an enormous transition or anything, you know, out of alignment with what we already uh, did here when we, um, when we instituted that. Excellent. 
Well, I once again extend our thanks to uh, everyone at the Fayetteville Free Library for uh, providing this amazing web series and encourage everyone to continue to be involved both with the programs that are be taking place at this year's annual conference and to uh, join and participate with the MSRT roundtable. Um, and that um, answers all of the questions that we had. And it concludes today's uh, program.